Welcome to the first lesson in a series of lessons on the engineering design process. Today's topic is an overview of the engineering design process. My name is Denny Davis. I'm a retired engineering professor and I will be teaching the lessons throughout this entire series. What is the engineering design process? Basically, it's a series of steps that an engineer or perhaps a team of engineers would utilize as they go from a need or opportunity that's been identified to develop, to create a design product, something that will deliver value to them. This could be a new business opportunity or perhaps a robot that's going to be extremely competitive. Entering design is a purposeful process one that uses our intelligence, uses artistic abilities, as you proceed through a process of creating a product or maybe a process to meet a particular need. Notice that the process may be a straight line, but much more commonly, it's a tortuous path. As you move forward, move back again, repeat steps, and eventually, end up at your completed design. Let's look at the design process a little bit uh, in terms of its phases of development. We begin a project at a starting point, move through this timeline, and eventually re uh, reach our finishing point. In so doing, we typically pass through four phases of this process. The first phase is problem definition, where we attempt to describe what the problem is and what a solution would look like that would satisfy this problem. The second phase is conceptual design, where we develop a type of solution that specifically identifies the functionality that we need, what it must do in order to meet those needs, what is not well developed. The third phase is a prototype where we actually build a model or a simple construction of our solution in order to test it and see how well it does meet the needs that we identified earlier. And finally, the fourth step, fourth stage, fourth phase, is that of completing the solution, developing it to the point where it has all the fineness, the features that we want for the solution that was envisioned at the beginning. At the end of each of these phases, we would have a milestone or a point of pause where we would reflect back on products that we've developed to be sure that we have the quality that we want along the way. The product from our problem definition is a well-defined problem. That includes a goal statement, the list of the needs that the user has identified, and possibly some limitations or constraints that tell us we have to stay within certain bounds. Once we define the problem, we move into this conceptual design stage where we create a vision or a model or an idea of what the solution will look like. What are its components? How would they work together? What must they do in order to meet the need? Once we have settled on the concept that makes the most sense, has the most potential, we move into prototyping, where we actually begin building a physical model or some kind of a detailed model that will enable us to evaluate how well it does function. Do the parts fit together? Do they perform as we had intended? Once we have uh, determined that we have the quality, the potential there, we move into the final um, completion stage where we develop that finished product that's going to be used to accomplish the needs we identified up front. So notice we, we go through the stage of defining the problem well, 
identifying a concept that has the functionality, the features that we believe are important to meet the needs. We fabricate model in some way to test whether or not that is going to meet those needs. And finally, we de develop the solution with its finished parts, the refinements that make it a finished product. Let's go through a simple design process exercise. One that will help us uh, see more concretely what we do during these four phases. We begin with the problem definition. Let's assume that our problem that we're attempting to address is the uh, waste products we have from the soft drink bottles, cut bottles. We'd like to develop a way to reuse these so that they become something useful instead of a waste product. So we begin by defining a list of needs. What might some of those be? Think about that for a minute. Well, one need is we want a product that is going to be useful. Something that's easily made. Something that ideally will use all the materials so we don't continue to have waste products. And ideally it's going to be cool. Something that people like, are excited about so that it could catch on and other people would develop similar kinds of uses. Once we've identified the problem, we begin to create some ideas. Now think about that for a minute. What might be some ideas on how these bottles could be reused? Here's a list of four possibilities. A bird feeder, a planter for small plants, a place to store coins, perhaps a scoop for picking up after your pet. Each of these ideas might have some merits, but we want to compare them to the needs that were stated earlier. So we look at each of these and rate them as to are they good, are they not good, in meeting each of the four needs that are listed in this particular case. So for each of these, we rate them positive or negative. And we begin to see here that the bird feeder seems to best meet the needs that we identified. So that tells us that that's an idea that's worth pursuing. We need to develop a concept, a conceptual solution. What would that bird feeder contain in it? Well, it needs to be able to hold some seeds that will be used to feed the birds. We need a way of hanging it in a convenient location. Need a place for the bird to perch for eating, and ideally, it's going to dispense the seed so that it continually provides seed for the birds. So, this gives us a concept that we want to test further. We begin the next stage by building a prototype. A bottle that contains a seed has these features that we defined as the concept. We attempt to test it by placing it where birds could come and enjoy the seed. We observe to see whether or not birds come, whether the seed is dispensed, see how well it meets the needs we identify. When it appears to be a good um, concept that has merit, we'll move into the solution completion phase. And here we begin to add some other features that might make it cool, perhaps make it dispense better, uh, hang better in the windstorm, and so on. So we have a product that's now cool, that meets the needs we've identified, and hopefully will become a product that others would adopt in order to utilize these waste products for something that is uh, useful and attractive to um, our, our people. Now, now, as we think about the design process, it actually includes a lot of steps, tasks, activities, 
that we would um, engage in during each of these phases. During the problem definition phase, if we're designing a robot, for example, we need to understand what the game strategy is that we have in mind. What is this robot going to do as it competes? What does a user want it to do? From this, we can uh, develop a list of the needs, the functionality, um, things that must do and be in order to be successful. From this, then, we can come up with uh, ideas on how to get the functionality. We screen the ideas to determine which of these best meet the needs. We attempt to put these ideas into a larger concept of how the robot would have these various parts that would work together to accomplish what's required for an effective game strategy. And finally, we select the concept, or perhaps uh, more than one concept, that really have potential to be successful in the game that we're uh, envisioning. Uh, we would move on to the prototyping. But before we actually start building, we need to specify the requirements. We've said that we need a certain functionality. Well, how fast? How far does it need to reach? We get more specific so that when we build this prototype, we're developing something that's going to have the functionality, the features, the exact nature that we want it to have to be competitive. Once we have developed a prototype that proves to be effective in meeting these needs, we move into the final stage of solution completion. Here we detail the solution. That means defining specifically what are the motors, what are the gears, what are the attachment points, how do we make this work, what is the program code that will support its performance. We then assemble the solution and we evaluate the solution. Now note that in evaluating at this point, we're evaluating it from the perspective of the user. So we have our operators, the actual game field, perhaps other robots on the field, and we test it to performance exactly as it would be used in the game. So we're evaluating the performance under very rigorous conditions. Now the risk analysis, which is listed last year, is something that may occur later in the season. Perhaps after we've identified that a number of uh, issues have arisen in our design, we wonder which ones to address first because our time is very limited. Risk analysis enables us to focus on those improvements that are going to have the greatest impact on the performance of our robot. So we're talking here about a design process that flows typically in the order listed here, from game strategy through defining needs, etc., until we get to evaluating the final solution and maybe risk analysis. Typically, we go in that order. But whenever a problem is seen, we return to an earlier task and repeat and begin moving forward from that point. We iterate or uh, what we might call loopbacks, where we go back in time to the point where we need to address the issue and move forward. We would ideally minimize the number of loopbacks and minimize how far back we go so that our process is more efficient and we don't waste the time in getting to our final solution. So ideally we're going to identify problems early because later on in the process making a loop back from there is going to cost us much more in terms of time and cost. Let's take an, a couple of examples here to see how making certain decisions might be costly to us. Let's say we're going to be gathering Nerf balls and we're going to do this when the robot is under program control. Now, 
our team starts thinking about solutions. Fred proposes on and everyone else agrees. Let's use a system that we used in past years that worked well for wiffle balls. Everyone agrees with it and they move on. The question is, what steps have been omitted and what might be the consequences of omitting these steps? Think about that. The omissions. We did not define the strategy. We needed our game strategy. And therefore, we did not clarify the needs. We did not generate alternative ideas. We did not screen these ideas based on needs. Therefore, the concept that we're pursuing was not well thought out and could have some flaws to it. What are the consequences of this? Well, first of all, we have less opportunity for innovation. We didn't think about some new ideas that could really make them innovative. We also could be missing out on better solutions, things that actually will work better because we chose them to fit the needs more carefully. A second example, let's say that we have a linkage on our robot and we've had occasions where it seemed to hang up at certain points in this movement. We're envisioning that that's a possible problem, but the team's in a hurry so they decide let's continue, let's use it now and we'll test it later after we've done our full prototyping. Okay, now let's think about what are the consequences of this action. Well, first of all, we're going to move ahead. We will have much work invested in what possibly ends up being a flawed concept. We also see that uh, if it's a problem or not is unknown until late in the process. So therefore, any loopbacks would be very costly. And thirdly, if we need to identify another concept, it will need to be identified late in this process, it will be short in time, it will need to be developed and proven very quickly, which could result in a lesser quality product. How do we avoid this problem? Well, number one, we should fully test that problem that we thought was occurring and find out early if this is indeed a concern. If we are uncertain, we can develop an alternative concept simultaneously as we move ahead so that if this one fails, we have another backup in a wing that could be adopted and used fairly quickly. So you see that looking at the design process, we can identify steps or actions that can be very costly. We can identify ways to avoid some of these problems that end up being pitfalls for teams. Now, you probably have a number of people on your team that have different modes of thinking. As you look at the design process, we'll see that we need a variety of thinking styles. We need the explorer, someone who's going to be thinking big, discovering, looking for greater opportunities. We need someone who's going to really probe and like a detective asking questions to really understand what's going on so we don't miss something. We need the artist, someone who imagines and creates new things, new ideas to give us some innovation. We need the engineer who is synthesizing, making things practical so that they'll actually work. We need someone who is a judge who evaluates critically so that they detect flaws and don't just gloss over them. We need someone who's a producer who really makes things work, working out the bugs so that something works in the end. So you see, we need a variety of different thinking styles that may come from a variety of different individuals. Notice that these individuals are going to be contributing to different steps in the design process. Uh, a few of them are shown here, but in many ways, these thinking styles are useful at many points in the design process. So in summary, 
if we want excellence in our engine design, we're going to need excellence at each phase of the design process. When we're looking at defining the problem, we're looking for a definition of the needs. We need needs that are inspiring and correct. When we get to the phase for developing concepts, we need innovation. We need things that are going to be feasible. They have potential to develop and be successful. When we move on to prototyping, we need to be sure that what we develop is practical. It's proven to perform as expected. And as we move into the final product, we need to make sure that it's effective, it's durable, it's going to deliver the needs, meet the needs that we had envisioned, and reliably perform for us. Without quality and excellence, each step along the way, we're going to significantly compromise the solution we get in the end. Notice that each person is going to be involved in asking questions, making contributions. In some way, they need to be working together to ensure that we have quality all along this development process. So we finished our first lesson. Notice that our series is going to include lessons on each of the other topics listed here. And this series is one produced with collaboration from two of our robotics FTC teams, Robraders and XBots. The lessons are actually uh, an enhancement of material that you find in the pre-engineering primer second edition that I have published. The video recordings of this lesson and each of the others will be found on Verity Design Learning com website uh, which I host. Thank you very much for your attention. We thank the first organization for their vision, for the structure that they have developed for the robotics competitions that enable sporting events for the mind. Have a great day. We'll look forward to seeing you again at our next class.